We need each other in the body of Christ. Um, and we need each other to help God pray, help us praise God together. So this song just says that. So if you would open mind, look to your neighbor real quick and say, hey, what's up, neighbor? Hey, neighbor. Can you help me to praise God this morning? Can you help me praise God this morning? Come on and praise the Lord with me. Praise the Lord with me. Come on and praise the Lord with me. Come on and praise the Lord with me. Let me sing it. Sing praise the Lord. Praise the Lord with me. Praise the Lord with me. Yeah. Come on and praise the Lord. With me, come on and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord with me. Come on and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord with me. Let's do it like this. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. With me. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. With me, come on and bless. Come on and bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Bless the Lord. Come on and bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Let's sing hallelujah, hallelujah, oh hallelujah, oh hallelujah, with me, sing hallelujah, hallelujah, oh hallelujah, oh hallelujah, with me, come on and clap, come on and clap your hands with me. Clap your hands. Clap your hands with me. He's worthy. Clap your hands. Clap your hands with me. Let's clap our hands to our Savior. Clap your hands with me. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. With me. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I need your help right here. Come on and dance before the Lord. And dance before the Lord. Dance before the Lord. Come on and dance before the Lord. Come on and dance. Come on and dance Come on and dance before the Lord. We gotta do it again. I'll see y'all dancing. Come on and dance before the Lord. Dance before the Lord. Do a little dance before the Lord. Let the joy of the Lord reach your feet this morning. Come on and dance before the Lord. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah. With me, sing hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. With me, yeah. Come on and do a little dance now. Come on and wave your hands. Come on and do a little dance now. Yeah. Come on and do a little dance now. Come on and wave your hands. Come on and do a little dance now. Help me sing. Come on and come on and do a little dance now. Everybody wave your hands. Everybody do a little dance now. Everybody do your dance. Everybody wave your hands. Yeah. Everybody do it, everybody do it, yeah. Everybody wave your hands. Everybody do a little dance. Everybody wave your hands. Everybody do a little dance. Everybody wave your hands. Yeah. Let's sing hallelujah, 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 oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, h
hallelujah with me. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah, oh hallelujah, oh hallelujah with me. One more time, everybody do your dance, yeah. Everybody do a little dance now. Everybody wave those hands. Everybody do a little dance now. Sing everybody, everybody, yeah. Everybody do a little dance now. Everybody wave your hands. Everybody do a little dance now. One more time. Sing everybody do a little dance. Cause God's been good. God's been kind. Everybody do a little dance, yeah. We praise the Lord. And we thank Him. Come on and praise. Come on and praise the Lord with me. Come on and praise. Come on and praise the Lord with me. Come on and praise. Come on and praise the Lord with me. Come on and praise. Come on and praise the Lord with me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I like that. Y'all keep that same energy all morning long. That same energy. While you're standing, just turn and greet somebody, say hello, and praise the Lord together with them. Come on and pray. Amen, amen, amen. Welcome, everyone. Feel free to be seated if you like, or stay on your feet if you like. You, you learn a lot of things about your congregation when the praise team leads that way. We about 5% Pentecostal, 15% Baptocostal. We about 70% Presbyterian, though. I, you know, we, Some of us still working on waving our hands. We like that here with it. It's all good, though. We praise God. We praise God. Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord. He's given us another week of grace and another morning to worship him and to praise his name. Uh, I'm Pastor Thabiti, one of the four pastors here at Anacostal River Church. And on behalf of the church family, I want to welcome everybody this morning. Do we have any first-time visitors with us this morning? Anybody here for the first time? Hey, welcome. Praise God. Praise God. We're glad that you would join us this morning. So honored to worship with you. Uh, as you can tell, we don't take ourselves seriously, but we do take the gospel seriously. So if you hear nothing else this morning, as you gather with us, we pray that you would hear the good news of Jesus Christ, what he's done uh, to save us and to make us God's own children this morning. <clears throat> A few announcements, um, church family, for us to govern ourselves by. Um, most of them are printed in your bulletins. I'll just bring a couple of them to mind this morning. Uh, this Tuesday at 7.30, we continue our grief share study. This is a, basically a small group study um, for those who are thinking through and processing grief. Could be a longstanding grief of many years. It could be a, a recent loss. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, it could even be a situation where you're anticipating the loss of someone and are grieving already. Uh, we welcome you. Tuesday, 730, um, grief shared. The details are in the bulletin. Uh, also, this Thursday is Prayer First Thursday. Uh, so at seven o'clock, uh, we'll gather online uh, and we will have our, our prayer meeting. So we invite everyone to come out uh, and to pray. We want to be a church that's marked by prayer, um, that's known to pray, and nothing really happens uh, apart from prayer. And so this Thursday at seven o'clock, let's gather together to go to God together um, and to pray all kinds of prayer for all kinds of people. Um, also, this morning, after the morning service, we will have our specially called members meeting. Uh, we'll dismiss here, take about a 15-minute break or so, get some things set up, uh, and then we'll reconvene in here um, for the meeting. So we ask um, all those members to uh, stay back with us uh, for the meeting. If you're visiting with us this morning, um, we, we will... You know, we, we would love to sort of linger with you, but uh, we can't this morning. We'll see you uh, when we dismiss. We'll fellowship for a little bit for about 15 minutes or so. Um, and then please excuse us and, and don't hold it against us that we have to regather for this meeting. 
Those are our announcements for this morning. And there is one birthday that we're celebrating this week, um, October 4th. So that's Tuesday. Our brother Thomas Matthews will be celebrating another year of life. Yeah. We give God praise for him. And uh, when you see him, do wish him a, a very happy birthday. Well, those are our announcements for this morning. Let's quiet our hearts and focus our minds to continue in praising God. Let's take a moment of silence. We gather this morning to worship the God-man, Jesus Christ, one who is himself of two natures, fully God and fully man, joined but not mixed. He is the one to whom every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And our call to worship this morning is celebrating that very fact in the words of Psalm 22, 29. You know how the Lord calls us to worship him. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. The psalmist is telling us here, whether you are prosperous or dying, we will all bow to him and worship him. We will all exalt his name. The good news is we get to do that before we die. We get to do that now. We get to do that to sing of his glory and his grace. And we're going to do that in our next two songs, printed on pages four to seven. Uh, Victory chant, hail Jesus, you are my king, and all hail the power of Jesus' name. So we invite everybody to stand this morning as we continue to praise God. Amen, amen. Good morning, church. How are y'all feeling this morning? All right. Y'all blessed this morning? Um, well, this next song, I need y'all's help, okay? I, I would love to see the congregation sing, sing out in response to um, our call to worship this morning, um, recognizing that God is worthy of our praise, um, and while we are yet living, while we yet have breath, we can use our breath to proclaim praise. So turn to your neighbor and say, Hail King Jesus. Hail King Jesus. Turn to the other neighbor. He was, they wasn't really listening. <laughs> Say, hey, I'll keep Jesus. Hey, I'll keep Jesus. All right, y'all. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna warm up. Um, so we're gonna start, and I want y'all to repeat after me. Okay, so sing, Hail Jesus, you're my King. Your life frees me to sing. I will praise you all my day. Perfect in all your ways. You're my Lord. And I will obey your word. I will obey your word. Because I want to see your kingdom come. Want to see your kingdom come. I will put yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Hail, hail, land of Judah. Hail, hail, land of Judah. How wonderful you are. How wonderful you are. Hail, hail, land of Judah. Hail, hail, land of Judah. See how powerful you are. How powerful you are. Right now. So let's sing now. Let's hey, hey. Let's go. Here we go. Here we go. Hey. Sing, Hail Jesus, you're my king. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Your life frees me to sing. Your life frees me to sing. I will praise you all my day. I will praise you all my day. Perfect in all your ways. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. I will obey your word. I will obey your word. I want to see your kingdom 
I want to see your kingdom come. Not my will, but yours be done. Glory, glory to the Lamb. Take us into the land. You take us into the land. We will conquer in your name. We will conquer in your name. And proclaim that Jesus reigns. Glory, glory to the Lamb. You will take us into the land. You will take us into the land. We will conquer in your name. And proclaim that Jesus How wonderful you are. Hail, 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 Hallelujah. 
we serve a reigning God. He's seated on the right hand Amen. of the Father right now. Um, and so, Lord, we just we give you honor, Lord. We give you power. We give you glory um, because you hold all power in your hands. Um, yeah, Lord, nothing, nothing can stand against you. You're God alone. And so, Lord, accept our praise, accept our worship, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to go to our scripture reading found in Hebrew 9, verses 11 to 22. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death since it is not in forces as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood, both the, temp, the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Let's pray um, in confession to our God. Lord God, this morning, um, in light of you, um, in light of your word, um, in light of all that you have revealed about yourself and about your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we um, acknowledge our own shortcomings, Lord. We acknowledge our sinfulness, Lord. We acknowledge that we have missed the mark. Lord God, this morning, I confess um, times, Lord God, um, that I, that, that we have um, made different standards than the ones that you have set for us and have measured up against those rules that we've created, those goals that we've made for ourselves um, that still fall short of your holiness and of your standard, God. Um, we know that uh, if you were to count our sins against us, if you were counting each one against us this morning, no one could stand, Lord. None of us could stand before you, God. But this morning, uh, we thank you that uh, blessed are those whose sins are covered. Blessed are those who tra whose transgressions are covered, Lord God. This morning, God, we ask that you remind us um, of what you have done for us, that you've given uh, your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, Lord, for our sins. Look, we acknowledge that um, every moment that he was there, um, he was bearing the weight of our sin, Lord. He was bearing the weight of our lies, Lord, of our deceit, Lord. 
He was bearing the weight um, of our sins against our brothers and sisters, Lord, of our hiding, um, the things that we struggle with, Lord. We should have confessed them to our brothers and confessed them to our sisters. And we should have reached out to those who we have um, offended and hurt before coming to you and asking you to bless us, Lord God. Would you forgive us, Lord? Would you have mercy on us, God? Help us to lay down our idols, to lay down those things that we have put before you, God. Those things that we wake up in the morning and think about and just do before acknowledging you, before seeking you, before asking you for wisdom, for asking you for help, God. We pray that you help us to do everything um, to the glory of your name, God, and not to ours, God. Forgive us for all of these things, Lord God, and especially those sins that we have no idea about, that we um, can't even keep up with, God, those things that we fall short of, God, that we um, have not confessed to you, God. I pray that you reveal them to us, God. Show us how we can worship you more fully, Lord God, and more freely, God, every day and every moment, God. And we ask this um, in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask for your spirit. Lord, help us to depend on you um, and not to quench you, Lord God. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Um, as we come to minister with and before you this next song, uh, it is a little bit different in that it is a song that is in the voice of the Father to his people. It's actually the words of the, that are printed for you in bulletin of the song are actual scripture, right? Um, referenced uh, in Luke 4, 18 and 19, right? The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken hearted, preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. And so, uh, for this moment in our time of worship, you are definitely welcome to come and sing with us. But more importantly, I want you to be able to envision the Father singing these words over you. Because he did and he does. Amen. I'm just going to take a moment, quiet your hearts. Everything that you came to in the store with, right? All of the burdens, all of the busyness, all of the what am I going to do next, all of the how long is the sermon going to be? Lay it aside. Center your heart. For the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He has anointed me. To preach good news, take away all of your sorrow and your mourning, to give the oil of joy and a garment of praise. For I have seen you in your captivity, and I will open up. Every prison doors arise, shine for your light is come, and my glory is rising upon you. See you in your captivity, and I will open up every prison door so arise and shine for your light is come, and my glory is rising upon you. Mm -hmm. 
and I am singing over you, and I am dancing over you, songs of deliverance, and I will set every captive free. And you will be with me for the Spirit, for the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He has anointed me me to preach good news, to take away all of your sorrow. And the morning to give you the oil of joy and the garment of joy. For I have seen you in your captivity, and I will open up every prison door so rise and shine for your light is come. And my glory is rising upon you. Because I have seen you, I have seen you in your captivity. And I will open up every prison door so rise and shine for your light has come. And my glory is rising upon you. And I am dancing. Sing over you, and I am singing over. I am singing over you. Songs of the songs of deliverance, and I will set every every captive you will be, and you will be with me. Cause I am singing, I'm singing over He sings His songs of deliverance over you. And sing over you, songs of the Lord. Deliverance tonight, we'll sing every captain. Every captain. Cause you are mine, cause you are mine, you are, you are mine, because the Lord and I have carried the weight of all of your burdens and carry the burdens of all your shame and i've called you by name called you by name you are mine and i have carried the weight of all your iniquity i've carried the burden of all your shame and i've called you by name i've called you by name you Of all your iniquities, I carry the burden of all your shame. I have called you by name, I've called you by name. You are mine. I carry the weight of all your iniquities, I carry the burden of all your shame. And I have called you by name, I've called you by name. Of all your iniquity, carry the burden 
of all your shame. He's called you by name, called you by name. You are, and he's dancing, dancing over you. He delights in you, and he sings over you. you, Lord, for how you sing songs of deliverance over us. We thank you, Lord, for the way that your blood covers our shame. We thank you, Lord, Father, that you had prophesied even before, Lord, we knew that we would fall so far that you, Lord, had already prophesied a Savior. You had already set up and orchestrated a way for us to be able to come to you. We thank you for this Christ. We thank you for the words that you sing over us. We thank you for how you rejoice in us. Father, that it is nothing that we can do that make us ourselves acceptable before you. There's nothing that we can do to clean ourselves up before coming to you, but that you sing over us anyway. That you've been singing over us, Lord, even before our parents had a thought of who we would be. You were singing over us. You foreknew us. Would you all join me in that chorus? Just, I'm dancing over you. I'm singing over you songs of deliverance. Right, but I want you to get, because uh, I know, right, it's been a hard week for some. Maybe it's been an easier week for some. But even in through the easy and the hard, he's still singing over you. Right? He's still dancing. He's still rejoicing that you are here. He's rejoicing that you're here and that you are his. There is such a sweetness and a greatness about that. There is nothing that you have done. There's nothing that you premeditated that inhibits his love. From the lowest of the low to the highest of the high in man's perception, God is still like, I'm singing over you. I seek your good. All right. And I am dancing over you. Just voice. I am singing. I am singing over you. Songs of deliverance and I will say. Every captive free, and you, will and you will be with me, and I'm dancing, and I am dancing over you, and I am singing, and I am singing over you. Songs of deliverance and I will set every captive. And you will be with him. And you will be with me. Amen. Amen. Just saying, and as the scripture says, 
banner over us is love. It exalts over us in song. Jeremiah 2 7. It's a long list of examples that are all different from the world we live in. Love my people the way I want them to be saved. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to have our offering. We're going to offer the offering. The children will be dismissed to their children's program. It's downstairs in the ICANN Theater. So if you've escort your little ones there, uh, there'll be some child care workers waiting there to receive them. And um, happy birthday again, Brother Thomas. Happy birthday on Tuesday. And so let's go to the Lord again in prayer. Let's pray. Father, indeed, we come to you because you do love us. It's the only way that we can come to you. In fact, we love you because you first loved us. And Lord Jesus, you gave yourself for us to wash us, as our sister prayed a moment ago, to make us clean and whole and right in your sight and to purchase for us an eternal kingdom, heaven with you. We thank you, Lord. And right now, every heart just lays before you its praise and its requests. Lord, you know the needs of every person in here, whether the needs are financial or medical, whether the needs are relational or social. You, you know every need, every worry, every fear, every doubt, every trembling. Every, every exasperated sigh, every wondering about whether or not it can go on, you know. So we pray that you would touch every heart, that you would calm every mind, that you would provide to every soul precisely what it needs, precisely what only you can give, and that you would strengthen us, oh Lord. That you would strengthen us and keep us Preserve us by your grace, we pray. Receive now the offering of our hearts and the offering of our hands. Be pleased by what we give to you, Lord. We are giving to you because we believe that you are worth it. We are ascribing to you uh, the glory, the honor, the worth that's due your name in our giving, O oh Lord. We give freely. We give cheerfully. We give in faith, knowing that you supply seed for the sower, knowing that you're able to increase our righteousness, Lord. We give, O oh Lord, hoping that you would multiply it. You'd multiply it for the service of your people and for the spread of your gospel. Receive now our hearts and the offering of our hands, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Children are dismissed. The ushers would come forward to receive the offering. Offering time. Y'all don't know the response. Offering time, blessing time. Offering time, <laughs> blessing time. Offering time, blessing time. Amen. Amen. I got Silas there. I, came from, I, 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 I come from a Pentecostal place, apparently. We do that. We do that. Um, yeah, so we're just going to sing, Oh, give thanks for all that we've been doing this morning. Um, he sings over us, He dances over us, He gave His life for us, and this is a small token that we can give back to Him. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. Yes, He is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good. Yes, he is. Sing. Oh, give thanks. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good. Yes, he is good. Oh, give thanks. unto the Lord. For he is good. Yes, he is good. For he is worthy.
and he is worthy. While you stand and give God praise, because he is worthy. God is good. He rejoices over us with singing, with dancing. We can offer our praise to his holy name. You all may be seated. This is, uh, we're going to take a break from the church series and back to basics, and we're going to continue in our series thinking about the doctrines of God. So we've talked about God and who he is. We talked about the scriptures. Um, we've talked about man, and today we're going to talk about Christ. We're going to lift up Christ today. So before we dive in, let's pray and go before the Lord. Father, we do give you praise, and we give you thanks now we pray, Lord, that you would speak for your people have gathered to hear from you, not from a man, but from you. Give us ears, O oh God, to hear by faith what the Spirit is saying. God, give us eyes to behold the marvelous truths from your word and give us a heart to love Jesus, to have deeper affection for him, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So how many of y'all seen The Woman King? Just by a quick show of hands. Okay. All right. Now, I knew the movie was going to be the bomb just based off of the preview, just on the strength of that, right? When John Boyega as King Gesu came on and you heard the music, it was like, doom. There was some suspense that was rising. Doom. And then my man came on with the smooth accent and he was like, there is an evil coming that threatens our kingdom, <laughs> that threatens our freedom, but we have a weapon that they are not prepared for. And then boom, Viola Davis jumps out from the tall grass, all greased up with the Agoji warriors, and they come out with the machetes and it's like, it's on, right? That's what the preview does, it whets your appetite. Now, in this case, the movie was actually better than the preview, but that's not always the case with some movies. The preview is not the main attraction. That's the principle. The preview is not the main attraction, but a good preview whets the appetite for the main attraction. And this is what we're going to notice today as we look through the scriptures, that God was showing previews all throughout history of Israel to let the world know that the main attraction is coming. The main attraction is coming. And there are three major offices of the Old Testament that God placed over his people in Israel. And those three were the prophet, the priest, and the king. The prophet was one who spoke for God. He was a representative for God to his people. And the prophets would not speak on their own, but they would speak what thus saith the Lord. And then you had the priests who also served as representatives. They served God in the tabernacle, and then they served God in the temple. And their role was to offer sacrifices and prayers on behalf of the people. Again, as a representative, the people could not come before God and they could not enter his presence because he was so holy and they were so sinful. They needed a representative. And then the other office that's there is the king. The king ruled over the people and conquered the enemies of the people. So we have the prophet who reveals, the priest who sacrifice and prays, and the king who rules and conquers. These were the appointed offices that provided physical and spiritual safety, security, and salvation for the people of Israel. And with these definitions in view, I want you to get the main takeaway from this sermon today. Because Jesus is the greater prophet, the greater priest, and the greater king, for all who put their faith in him have a great assurance of salvation. Oh, that's good. And he has put all of these things together, not just for the glory of his praise, but because he loves us. These are things that he put in place to point to a greater thing because he loves us. Again, the main point, because Jesus is the greater prophet, the greater priest, and the greater king, for all who put their faith in him have a great assurance of salvation. So Jesus is greater than Moses. By the way, if you need a Bible, raise your hand. The ushers can provide one for you. 
We're good. All right. So Jesus as the greater Moses. Why Moses? Why Moses? Why start there? Well, of all of Israel's great prophets, there was none that was greater than Moses. In fact, Moses had a movie, right? He was a major figure. Even to this day, he was and he is highly respected both by Jews and Muslims. And you know, Jews and Muslims don't agree on a lot, but what they do agree on is that Moses was a great prophet. He was considered one of the greats. You remember Moses? He was the one who led the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt. He led the children through the Red Sea. Moses was the one who received the Ten Commandments on Mount Horeb. He would even speak to God as a man speaks to a friend. And it's amazing, even when you pause and think about that, that no one else could do that, but Moses had that opportunity and that privilege. And today we have that same privilege and opportunity. And this is what Moses did. Moses was the real deal. Yet in the greatness of him being a prophet and all that he did, he was only a preview for what was to come. This very same Moses predicted that there will come a day when a prophet just like him would appear. In Deuteronomy 18, 15, 18, 15 to 18, we have a preview of the prophet, a preview of the prophet. Moses speaking to the new generation of Israelites is about to transition off the scene. And he tells them, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see the great fire anymore, lest I die. Get God's great mercy even in that, providing a way so that the people would not die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Moses served as a mediator, as a deliverer, as a type of savior to the people. He was beloved. And now the question is, who will or who can succeed Moses when he dies? And that's just the human nature, right? But God is not like us. Human nature says, who will come? What? There was a great man now. Who's going to replace him? But God is not in heaven wringing his hands. But we are just dust. We're here today. We're gone tomorrow. There's a start date for us, for all people, great or small. And then there's an end date. On the tombstone, when you see that, there's a dash right in between. The question is, what do you do with the dash? What do you do with the dash? And Moses lived a full life. And from the time that he spoke these words, there had been a suspense and anticipation of this Moses type figure who would then come and replace him. But if you think about the characteristics and what Moses said of who it would be, it was real generic, right? They didn't know who it could be. Would he be so, it says specifically, it would be someone called by God. It would be from among God's people. He would speak directly for God all that he commanded. Like, wow, Moses, that can be any and anybody, right? No timing of the prophet's arrival, no description of the prophet's appearance, no height, no weight, nothing. But it was God who set it up like that. And God's will and God's timing is always perfect. And that should be an encouragement to us today, family, that God is actually merciful not to tell us everything at once. You think of Deuteronomy 29, 29, that the secret things belong to God, but the things revealed belong to us. Let us handle the things that he has given us plainly and clearly, right? So in other words, he tells us not just, he tells us just enough to sustain us and for us to put our trust and hope in him, to walk by faith and not by sight. And now after Moses was there um, telling the people about this prophet to come, there had been a bunch of prophets that came behind Moses. People like Samuel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and so many more. But they had two things in common. They were all flawed individuals, and they all pointed to someone greater. That's the Old Testament preview. Now, in the New Testament, the reality is found in Acts 3, 22 to 24. And this is right at the birth of the church. And Peter was a leader among them during this time, and he stood up. 
And he makes clear to these Jewish background believers that Jesus is that anticipated prophet. In Acts 3, 22 to 24, it says, Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. And you shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to the prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who had spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaim these days. Now, this is absolutely amazing. You see what he's saying here? He's saying that Moses and all the prophets of all the scriptures served as a shadow, as a preview, as a type to the main attraction, the prophet Jesus. Now, the issue is when we look at the New Testament, especially in the epistles, we don't necessarily see Jesus referred to as the prophet. Why is that? We also really don't see him referred to in the Gospels. There are instances, like for instance, in Mark chapter 8, verse 27 and 28, which is the turning point, the linchpin uh, of that particular gospel in Mark, in Jesus' ministry, he's walking, he's chopping up with Peter and the rest of the disciples, and he turns to them and he asks them this very pointed and specific question that we all, each one of us in here, have to wrestle with one day. Who? do men say that I am? And they responded, John the Baptist, others say Elijah's, others say one of the prophets. And at this point, no one really knew for sure who Jesus really was, even his disciples. And now he was going about doing signs, wonders, miracles, all the things prophets do. But then he would tell people not to say anything, to keep quiet, because his time had not yet come. On another occasion, he met a woman at the well in John 4. And Jesus went intentionally to this area where typically Jews would never go. And he seen the woman at the well and offered her living water, this water that would quench her thirst forever. And he told her things about herself that she had never disclosed to anyone else. And she said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. She knew that there was something different about this Jesus, how he knew things about her without her ever telling him anything. And on another occasion, when Jesus does the multiplication of the fish and the loaves in John 6, 14, it reminds the people who are there in attendance what God did through Moses in the desert where he provided manna from heaven. John 6, 14, it says, when the people saw the sign that Jesus had done, They said, this indeed is the prophet who was to come into the world. This indeed is the prophet who was to come into the world. They recognized that Jesus was a prophet like Moses. And then Jesus himself even said, a prophet is not with honor in his own hometown. And there was a few more examples in the the gospels, but why the loud silence when we look at the epistles? We don't see the title prophet used for Jesus, but our Muslim friends say Jesus was a prophet and nothing more. Our Jewish friends say Jesus was a false prophet and nothing more. Well, when we look at Hebrews 1, 1 to 2, it gives us insight. It gives us an apologetic to this question. The author is writing in this context to Jewish background believers who are suffering, and as a result, they're ready to abandon the faith. They're ready to give up the main attraction and go back to the preview. And the author is trying to tell them by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, don't go back, don't go back. Jesus is worth it. Jesus is far superior, and he is worth it. In the same vein, the songwriter wrote this hymn where he says, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Family, is this your song this morning? Brothers and sisters, is this your testimony? Settle in your heart today, no turning back back. And in Hebrews chapter one, one to two, the author doesn't sing these lyrics, but he says these words. He says, long ago, and at many times, and in many ways, 
God spoke to our fathers by prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So you notice here that the author does not just say Jesus is a prophet, but rather he begins to explain how Jesus is far superior as a son. So in one sense, he is a prophet, but in another sense, he is so much more. He's greater than a prophet. He is the one that all prophecies were made. Oh, may the Lord give us grace. May he give us courage to explain these things to our Muslim and Jewish friends. Jot these down. This is absolutely amazing when we think about them. In Isaiah 7, 14, the prophet prophesies about Jesus's virgin birth. In Micah 5, 2, the prophet describes Bethlehem as the exact place where Jesus would be born. In Isaiah 11, 2, the prophet speaks about Jesus having these characteristics of wisdom, counsel, understanding, and might. These are written seven, 800 years before Christ even stepped on the scene. Zechariah 9, 9, the prophet tells how Jesus would enter Jerusalem on a donkey. Zechariah 11, 12 to 13, details how Judas would betray him. The details are staggering. Isaiah 53 explains that the Savior would be despised, rejected, would carry our sorrows, and be wounded for our transgressions. The gospel was preached right there in Isaiah 800 or so years earlier. And others would prophesy down to the details where Jesus would be pierced in his very side in Zechariah 12.10. We don't want to rush past that. We want to pause and think about that for a minute and recognize that the Bible you hold in your hand, whether it's paper or whether it's on a screen, is God-breathed and absolutely trustworthy. 66 books, 40 authors, over a 1,500-year time span, and yet it's one story with one hero, Jesus Christ. And the question is not if you can trust it. The question is, will you obey it? He was not just the messenger like all the other prophets, but he was the absolute source. When Isaiah spoke, he didn't speak for himself, but he spoke for God. Same with Joel, Amos, and Obadiah. But when Jesus speaks, he's speaking God's word in real time with real authority. He says, not thus saith the Lord, but he says, I say unto you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Real time, real authority. <laughs> so because his office as a prophet was greater than Moses, he uniquely qualifies to reveal what God is like. Why? Because he was there with the Father and the Spirit in the beginning. If you want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus' ministry didn't start when he stepped on the scene in Jerusalem. But he can be traced all the way back before the beginning of the entire universe. In John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as the only son from the father full of grace and truth. He is the ultimate prophet. The word of God literally becoming flesh, and this is why John in um, chapter one, verse 18 can say, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the father's side. He, Jesus, has made him known. Jesus is greater than Moses because he's revealed and made God known. So when we look at all of this, we see this, why does it matter? Why does it matter to me that Jesus is the greater prophet? It's because we can have great assurance of our salvation, a firm footing of our faith. Since Jesus revealed God, not just in word, but also in action, he did so in no other way that no other prophet ever could. He not only spoke for God, but he spoke as God. And as a result, he reveals to us God's character and his purposes. So in other words, God is love, but we would not fully understand that love. So Christ demonstrates the nature of God's love and mercy and sacrifice. Christ demonstrates the nature of God's holiness and justice and righteousness. And at the cross, they all meet. 
And before Jesus took his last breath on the cross, he said, it is finished. The word said, it is finished. For those that repent and believe in Jesus, it is finished. Your sins are no longer counted against you. It is finished. Peter, it is finished. <laughs> Ashley, it is finished. LaRonda, Phil, the Beatty, John, Dietrich, it is finished. You can have a firm assurance of your salvation because the literal word gave his word. It is finished. Hold on to that, fam. He gave his word. Christ as priest, again, as I mentioned earlier, the priest's job was to offer sacrifices to atone for sin and offer prayers on behalf of the people. Sacrifice and intercession was the main function of the priest. And the office begins with Aaron. Aaron was called and used by God powerfully. You all remember Aaron. He doesn't have a movie, but he was the co-star. Aaron is Moses' older brother that the Lord called to speak for Moses. He performs miracles. He helped lead the Israelites out of Egypt. He helped hold up Moses' hands in order to gain victory over the Amalekites. He was God. He, he was uh, used by God. God instructed Aaron on the blessing of his people. You know, the ironic blessing, Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. This is that Aaron. He was also commissioned as the very first priest. And he was from the tribe of Levi. So in Exodus 28, verse one, this is where God declared the priesthood in office that will be passed down from generation to generation. Exodus 28, verse one. Again, Old Testament preview of the priest. God says, then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with you from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. So as we can see, Aaron was the first priest, but not the last priest. And each of the priests that succeeded him again had these two things in common. One, they were all flawed individuals. And two, they pointed to something greater. So when we think about sacrifice, when you think about the sacrifice of animals, um, it can be traumatizing. I remember I was talking to a sister the other day and she said, when I was young, I went back home to my country and my mother brought me to my uncle and my uncle was slaughtering a goat or a lamb or something. She said, that never left me. And now it's 30 years later and it still sticks in my mind. It can be traumatizing. It's a bloody scene. Why the blood? Why the separate? Why the rituals? It's a violent sight, horrifying sounds of dying animals, the nauseating smell. All of your senses are being impacted. It was all meant to remain in the minds of the people of how holy and perfect and pure God is and that we are dust sinful men and women. And sin is so devastating that something had to die. Something had to suffer and die. And life is in the blood. And there needs to be a scapegoat, a propitiation, because without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And yet the thousands and thousands and thousands of sacrifices weren't enough. It was only temporary. The high priest once a year on the day of atonement would take sacrifice animal blood into the most holy place behind the veil and before God. And he was the only one that could do this and would make a sacrifice, not just for the people, but also for himself. So even the ritual, the ceremony was a copy. In Hebrews 9, 23 to 29, it says, thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered, not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. 
nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So we see here that Jesus is both the greater priest, but he's also the greater sacrifice. The better sacrifice that's mentioned in this passage is one, it talks about how he was a single and unique offering um, at that one time. And he does not have to suffer again or repeat it like the, the, the priest of old had to go in over and over. He does not have to perform that over and over. It was a one-time event that was sufficient for all our sins, past, present, and future. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, the blood. Look, Tano, if this is Pentecostal, we couldn't hold them from running around, right? This is is why, this is why when you write them songs, oh, the blood of Jesus, it makes me white as snow. See, there's some deep theology underneath that. His blood was so much more than the blood of bulls and goats and lambs that was temporary. His blood was for eternity. And there has been a final payment of the problem of sin by Christ Jesus at one point in all of human history. He is the great priest and also the great sacrifice. Another major function of the priest was intercession. Do you realize that at this very time, Jesus is continually praying for you? The high priest in Israel would have this ephod. It's kind of elaborate priestly garment. It was laced out with blue, purple, scarlet, gold thread, and stones. I mean, literally, it had 12 stones that represented the 12 tribes of the names of, of those tribes on the shoulder pads. And the priest would symbolically like carry the people of Israel before God and offer up prayers on their behalf. Like the symbol of that is amazing when you think about intercessory prayer and bringing petitions before God on behalf of other people. Because the people had a problem. They could not go before God on their own and live because of sin. They needed a mediator who would go between them, between God and man. And every priest that served as a mediator, guess what? He died because all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And the wages of that sin is death. But there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave his life as a ransom for all. He fulfills that role forever on your behalf by bringing us into his presence, but also praying for us. While on earth, we see a glimpse of this ministry of intercession. If you think Luke 22, 31, where Jesus told Peter, right? Matter of fact, he said, Simon, Simon. He called him his old old school name, right? Simon, Simon. Satan has demanded to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. And when you return, strengthen your brothers. So like he talks about the past, future, all in the same verse. It's just amazing, right? Luke 22, 31 says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So it was Jesus's intercession that was able to keep him from failing and falling completely. It was Jesus's prayer that kept him from shipwrecking his face. It it was Jesus's prayer that was greater than Satan's attempt. In his high priestly prayer in John 17, when he prayed for his disciples before going to the cross, we see the same ministry of intercession. And what Jesus did for his disciples while on earth, he continues to do for you all in heaven. Hebrews 7.25 says, we are told that he ever lives to make intercession, who draw near to God through him. And we are told that he appears in the presence of God on our behalf. That Old Testament system, it created distance between man and God. But now all throughout the book of Hebrews, the author is reminding us that we can draw near. We can draw near. We can come close to God. And know this Christian, no demon in hell can bring an accusation against you that will stand because we have an advocate. 
we have an advocate that stands in the very presence of God. The accuser does not trump the advocate. The advocate cannot be trumped by the accuser. Romans 8.34 says, who then, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and he is always interceding for us. Jesus is making specific requests for us, praying for us even now. Thank you, Jesus. The scriptures are clear that there is one God and one mediator. We have access and no longer need an earthly priest because we have Jesus as our great high priest. In the Old Testament, we did. In the New Testament, we don't. Jesus is greater than Aaron because it is once for all sacrifice and his continual intercession on our behalf. And because of that, we can have a great assurance of our salvation. Christ is king. In the Old Testament, the king had authority over the nation of Israel. The king ruled God's people and conquered God's enemies. The king reigns and the king conquers. There was no other king in Israel's history that embodied reigning, ruling, and conquering like King David. No other king. He was a man of war that had many military victories in every affliction, in every trial. It was David who held on and trusted in the Lord. He was a king in which all future kings in Israel measured up to. He was both a shepherd king and a warrior poet. Like, how do those even mix, right? But that's David. He wrote most of the Psalms. And when we see the Psalms and we read the song, it gives language to some of the emotions that we feel because David had this relationship with the Lord and he trusted in him. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 8, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Psalm 55, 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. David was called a man after God's own heart. And although David was a great king and other kings that follow him was great and not so great, they again had two things in common. They were flawed individuals and they pointed to something greater. Isaiah prophesied that Israel's failed kings will result in God's king, the Messiah, on David's throne forever. The Old Testament preview of the king is from Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. For for, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So here Isaiah recorded five things about the coming king. Be born a child. He'll rule over God's people and the governments of the world. He'll have four descriptive names that will reveal his character. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Four, he'll be seated on David's throne and have an everlasting rule. And lastly, five, this will be accomplished by the zeal of the Lord Almighty, that the coming of the kingdom depends on God and not on man. So we see that the New Testament reality when the angel Gabriel came and appeared to Mary during her pregnancy. And he announced that she would bear a son, child born, who would be a ruler, not just a king, but God himself. And he would be seated on David's throne forever. Luke 1, 32 to 33. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Let's talk about Jesus. Jesus is the New Testament reality of the Davidic preview. Christ rules. The son of David, again, kings rule. 
Christ rules. The son of David would be a ruler of God's people and also the deliverer. But the Jews, when Jesus came on the scene, they expected something different. They wanted a political leader. They believed the king would come and destroy the Roman government and free them from oppression. But when Jesus came on the scene healing people and doing miracles, turning water into wine, fish sandwiches, all of that, the people were like, yo, this is our guy. Not only is he going to free us, but he's going to give us free food, too. Their gods was their stomach and their glory was their shame. Their minds were set on earthly things. They had no idea about Christ's kingdom, no idea what his kingdom was about. But truth be told, we have to stop here because we need to look in the mirror of the scriptures as well. Is Christ enough for you today, family? Like, really, do you find your satisfaction in the king or do you find your satisfaction in the king's gifts, what he provides? When you don't get what you want, when you face disappointment, is he still Lord? Or better yet, is he still Lord of your life? Do you take Jesus off like a garment when things are hard? Or do you cling to him tighter knowing that it's actually him who is holding you and keeping you? When we consider John chapter 6, verse 15, these folks wanted the gifts, but they didn't want the king. And this is right after the occasion of Jesus feeding the 5,000. It says in John 6, 15, perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king. Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. You see, Jesus knows our hearts and he refused to be the type of king that the people wanted. His kingdom was different. John 18, 36, Jesus is on trial right before his death. And he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, though, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. See, Jesus is king, but he is a different kind of king in a different kind of kingdom. And when he called people to repent for the kingdom is at hand, it's not an earthly kingdom of this world, but it's the kingdom of heaven. And what is the kingdom of heaven? It is where God rules and reigns in the heart of his people who are subject and obedient to him. Again, the kingdom of heaven is where God rules and reigns in the hearts of the people who are subject and obedient to him. It is the church where the people of God live under Jesus's kingdom, under his rule now, while waiting for the future of the fullness of God's kingdom to come. So Ephesians 1, 20 and 22, it says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. So although he rules now, we as the church are living in an already and not yet of the kingdom of God. Not yet, because not everyone is subjected and obedient to our king. So the king has given us a kingdom mandate to his church to go and make disciples. Right? I like the way Erickson put it in his book on Christian theology. He said, a time is coming when the reign of Christ will be complete. Then all will be under his rule, whether willingly and eagerly or unwillingly and reluctantly. We see this truth in Philippians 2 and verse 10 and 11. He says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The King reigns and the King will reign. King reigns, but the King also conquers. In 1 Corinthians 15, 25, it says, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. You see, Jesus won the supreme victory at the cross. This was the ultimate plot twist. It was at the cross that the power of sin and death was broken. That wasn't the end. After the crucifixion, there was burial when he died because he really died. 
But then on the third day, he rose from the dead. And now we can share in that victory with our conquering king. See, the enemy thought he had won the victory with the death of Christ. But instead, Christ's death set us free from the prison of sin, and it disarmed the enemy. Colossians 1, Colossians 2, 13 to 15. He says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Jesus is a greater king than David. As a prophet, he has given us great assurance with the sure word, it is finished. As a priest, he has given us great assurance of our salvation as a perfect priest and a perfect sacrifice representing us to the Father. And as king, he has given us a great assurance of our salvation and the fact that we are now united with our king. We are heirs with God and co-heirs with Christ. And when Christ conquered death for us, he removed the sting of death. This means that he will, we will not, those who believe will not be judged by God according to our sins no more. Rather, we will stand before God robed in Christ's own perfect righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the prophet greater than Moses. Hallelujah to the priest greater than Aaron. And hallelujah to the king greater than David. And one last thing. For those who are not yet Christians, every believer in here knows how the story ends. The king is victorious and his enemies are vanquished. Because of your sin, it has not only separated you from God, but he's made you an enemy of God. And every day you are storing up wrath for the day of judgment. And you'll have to face him. It says in Hebrews 10, 13, that it is a dreadful and fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's the bad news. But the good news is that Jesus has made a way of escape in the fullness of time. He was born of a virgin according to all of the prophecies that we've seen in the Old Testament, all of the previews, all the types, all of the shadows. And he lived a life we couldn't live, that you could not, and you know you cannot live, holy and perfect and righteous in every way. And then he died the death that we, each one of us, should have died. And he did this as a demonstration of his love. Christ died for us, but he didn't stay dead. On the third day, he rose with all power, defeating sin, death, and the grave as proof that he is who he said that he is, the son of God, the great prophet, the great priest, and the great king. So before you leave today, to hearing this, God calls you to repentance, not just to hear the good news, but to respond to it. Repent, repent, turn from your sins and put your trust in Jesus. And if you have questions, comments, or concerns, on your row, ask two questions to someone there. One, are you a Christian? And two, what must I do to be saved? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word, which indeed is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It discerns the thoughts and the intent of our hearts. We thank you, God, that you can speak to every situation and that you will be glorified. You will be magnified. We choose now, God. Oh, God, continue to work in the hearts and the lives of your people in this, your church, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
you are thankful that the word became flesh. Let's meditate on that as we sing this song together. Please stand and sing with us. Down from glory, down yeah. from glory. The many things he yeah. had, many things you are honored. Oh, the holy king of Carpenter. You are the living awesome word. ruler, awesome ruler, gentle redeemer. You God with us here. Yeah. God with us, the living truth. truth. And what a friend we have in you. You are the awesome ruler. ruler. Awesome ruler. Gentle redeemer. Gentle redeemer. You God with us here. Yeah. God with us, the living truth. And what a friend we have in you. You are, you are an awesome ruler, awesome ruler, gentle redeemer. You God with us, God with us, the living and true. And what a friend we have in you. Only love to your name. You are Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's what we call you. That's what we call you. You were born in the manger. Born the Lord in the country. You died to save you, man. You are the Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's what we call you. We call you. Major born, the Lord of the You died to save humanity. You are the living one. Oh, 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 That's what we call you. That's what we call you. Say Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, 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 oh. You are the living word. Oh, 
Jesus, Jesus. That's what we call you. Made your woman on a tree. You died to save you. You are the living one. Jesus, that's what we call that's you. That's what we call you. Never a Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, oh, 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 you are the living Jesus, 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 that's what we call you. Jesus, Jesus, oh, 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 Jesus, Jesus, that's what we call you. Made your born but on the tree. You died to save me, man. Let's You are the living word. Jesus, Jesus, that's what we call you. Made your born but on a tree. You died to save humanity. You are the living word. Amen. Give him praise. Indeed, he is the living word. The preacher told us this morning that because Jesus is the greater prophet, the greater priest, and the greater king, all who put their faith in him have a great assurance of salvation. I wonder if you heard the preacher this morning when he said, you can have a firm assurance of your salvation because the living word gave you his word. It is finished. Praise be to God. Praise be to God for our great Savior. The question still rings in my ear. The question is not if you can trust it, the word of God. The question is, will you obey it? you put your faith in the living word in Jesus crucified, buried, and resurrected and when you go on trusting him as not only the living word, the resurrected word the final word may it be so in a moment I'm going to get a benediction and then we will uh, be seated and have a moment of silence and when the praise team uh, strikes up again we'll be dismissed recall now we're going to take about a 15 minute break um, so to gather your children from the children's ministry if they're there uh, greet visitors, use the restroom, things of that sort. So right about noon, uh, we'll come back in here, uh, the members of the church for our members meeting. Um, hopefully that won't take more than about half an hour tops, hopefully. Um, and so we'll gather here for that meeting and uh, then we'll be dismissed for the day. So here now the blessing of the Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all both now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated.
Present my body, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, Lord, unto you. I present my body, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, Lord, unto you. That works. I present my body, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, Lord. Unto you, I present my body, living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, Lord. Unto you, sing my body, my body is an instrument of praise. May 